We can break any layout down to three objects, lines, pictures, and text. To put a picture on the page, we draw a box and put a picture into it. To put text on the page, we draw a box and put text into it. The objects we use for pictures and text are frames. Here we have the rectangle frame tool and the rectangle tool. Both of these objects can contain a picture or text. Let's begin with the rectangle frame tool. This tool is your building block of the document. If I click and drag out a box, I can now put a picture or text into this box. I can resize this box, reposition this box, put a stroke or a border around the box, put a fill color into the box, round off the corners of this box. There's lots that I can do. So how do I transform this object or move this object? First thing we notice when we draw the box, if I wanted to move this box, the inclination would be to draw the box and then click and move it. However, I am still on the frame tool. That means that if I click and drag, I will draw another box. Let me undo that. Command Z or Control Z if you're on Windows under the edit menu is undo. So your workflow should be that anytime you use another tool like the frame tool and you draw a box, you should then go right back to the selection tool. By going back to the selection tool, that's the black arrow at the top of the toolbar, you can then manipulate, move, resize, rotate an object. And the keyboard shortcut is V to go back to the selection tool. So I can simply type V on my keyboard. And remember, if you're typing text in a text box and you hit V, you'll type a V. So in this case, you can hit escape on your keyboard, that's in the upper left corner, and you'll go back to the selection tool. So now that I'm on the selection tool, I can manipulate this object. I'm going to be using the control panel to do most of this work. Again, that's the panel at the top of the screen that changes over and over and over again to suit the needs of what you're doing at that moment based on the combination of the tool that you have selected and the object or objects that are selected on the page. Let's look at the default appearance of the control panel with a simple object selected. We have our X and Y coordinates. This is the physical location of the object on the page, the X being the horizontal measure and the Y being the vertical. And you can see with our rulers here along the horizontal and the vertical, that is where that object lines up. If your rulers are not showing, you can go to the View menu and choose Show Rulers or Command R or Control R on Windows. Mine says Hide Rulers since my rulers are showing. And you can see the zero, 00 mark is here at the upper left corner of my page. I can also change my zero, 00 marker by grabbing the origin and dragging it to wherever I want it to be. And I can reset the origin by double clicking in the upper left corner of the rulers where they meet. So this object is at that location on the page, and as I move that object around, you can see that number changing dynamically. It's useful to see the X and Y to line objects up on the page or to position them specifically where you want on the page. We can change our X and Y coordinate by using the up and down arrows within the field. And a trick that's useful to know, the shift key on the keyboard always gives you a larger increment. No matter what you're doing, the shift key will always give you a larger increment. So if I use the up arrow, I can move that object by a certain increment. If I hold the shift key down in combination, it will go by a larger increment. Useful to know when changing the value in any field or when nudging. The nudge keys are your arrows on your keyboard, the up, down, left, and right arrows. And if I use those arrows now, you can see I'm nudging the object around the page without ever clicking in those fields. And if I hold the shift key down in combination, I'll nudge by a larger amount. Believe it or not, this little step can save you a lot of time cumulatively over the course of your work in InDesign. But what's really important in the control panel is the reference point. That is this grid of points here. These nine points relate to the eight hollow points around the edge of the object and the one point inside in the middle, which you don't see. You'll notice that on this frame, we also have a blue box and a yellow box. These are for different uses. The blue box is for anchoring this object into a flow of text. We'll be dealing with that later on. And the yellow box is for changing the corner radius of this object. I'll come right back to that in just a few moments. You can see that as I change my reference point by clicking any one of these nine points, my X and Y values will change. 
The reference point is like putting a pin in the object and anchoring it to the page at that point. And then everything is measured from that reference point. My X and Y coordinate, my width and height, my rotation, everything is measured from the reference point. It's important to know how to use the reference point to your advantage. It's going to make your life a lot easier. And we'll continue to use the reference point as we move forward in building our magazine. So if I want this object positioned, let's say one and a half inches, 1.5 inches from the left side of the page and one inch from the top of the page, I could try to move the object into position until those numbers make sense, but that's laborious. I'd rather type a number into these fields. But what I have to be aware of is where my reference point is. For instance, if my reference point is in the middle and I type in the X coordinate to be 1.5, I'll tab to the next field type in one, and then I need to activate this field by either clicking outside of it on the page or by hitting the return key on my keyboard. And that will position that object on the page, but it's not right. What's happening is the middle point, that's right here, is positioned now at 1.5 by one. That can be confusing. When you're positioning an object, inherently we are thinking about the upper left corner. So by clicking on the upper left corner, and changing this now to 1.5 inches in the X direction. I'll tab to activate that field and go to the next field, type in one, I'll hit return, and there we go. Now the upper left corner is at 1.5 in the X and one in the Y, and that's positioned exactly where I want it. The width of the box and the height of the box can be linked or unlinked. Right now they're unlinked. This is the same icon we saw when creating a new document and changing our page margins and bleed and slug area. If I increase the width, you'll see that it's growing from the reference point. That's the upper left corner. If I change the reference point and change my width, you'll see that it's anchored now on the right hand side from the upper right corner. And the height grows as well or shrinks. If I link those two together now as I change the width, the height will change proportionally. I'll change my reference point to the upper left corner and I'll increase the width and height and you can see they move proportionally from the reference point. Again, if I change it to the middle, you'll see it grows from the middle or shrinks to the middle. And the shift key for larger increments. Then we have our scale X percentage and scale Y percentage. If you ever have a question about what these fields are, you can roll your mouse over the icon to the left of the field and it will give you a tool tip telling you what that field is. These are automatically linked by default. I could unlink them, but I'll keep them linked. This will allow me to change the percentage size of the object. Now you'll notice that let's say I bring this object down to 75% in the X and the Y because they're linked proportionally. The box will change to 75% of its size, but then return to 100%, telling us that this box is 100% of its size at all times. What's interesting about this field, if you have an image in this box, and we'll see that later on in a future lesson, and you change the size of that image inside of the box, let's say you reduce it down to 24.2%, you'll see this number reflect that at 24.2%. So if you're focused on the object, that's the box itself, this will show 100%. And if you're focused on the image, this will show the image size itself. We have rotation. This rotates the object by one degree. If I hold down my shift key, I'll get a larger increment of five degrees. And this is rotating from the reference point. Let me put this back to zero, change my reference point to the lower right corner, and now when I rotate, it's rotating from that anchored point in the lower right corner. I'll set that back to zero. Next, I have the shear angle. This will shear the object. This is not something you'll do very often. And if I go in a negative direction, by the way, you'll always see that the negative values are always represented with a negative number. Go back to zero here. Not something you'll do very often, but perhaps occasionally as a design element, you may want to use this. Continuing on in the control panel, I can rotate 90 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise. I could do that from the rotation angle as well, but this is just a very fast way to rotate the object. And you'll notice again, it's using the anchor point to secure that object in place as I rotate. As I rotate, I also have a visual representation here of this P to show what is happening with that object. It can get a little confusing. Did I rotate that or not rotate that? In this case, I've got the blue and the yellow blocks here. And that helps give me some understanding of what I'm doing. But if those weren't there and I can hide those, and I'll show you how to do that in just a moment, this visual representation is very helpful. And I can flip that object. 
horizontally or vertically. And this is like flipping it in a mirror. This is flipping the object itself and any content inside of that object. We then have four icons that allow us to get inside of a group of objects. If I have more than one object here, I can choose with my selection tool to select both of those objects. I can do that in a couple of ways. I can use the shift key to select multiple objects. In fact, let me add one more to that mix here. There we go. I'll use my shift key to select more than one object. I can also use the shift key to remove objects from a selection. That's definitely a way to select objects. Sometimes it's a little easier just to use the selection tool itself to click and drag anywhere on the page and anything that this selection area touches will get selected. That's a little bit easier. Once all three objects are selected, I can visit the object menu for objects, group them together or command G or control G on a Windows computer and group those objects together. Now I can move those objects as one unit, click off of them, click on them, and they continue to stay grouped. There are a couple of ways I can get inside of that group. If I wanted to manipulate one object within the group, I could choose to ungroup the object or shift command G or shift control G on a Windows computer, do some work on one object, and then group them again, but that's a little laborious. I can use these tools in the control panel to select the content within the group and then move around the group just like that. That's definitely a useful tool, but for me, the easiest way to select an object within a group is simply to double click on the object and that selects the object. And now I'm inside the group and I can work with all of the objects independently, even move them, resize them. And then if I deselect and select again, I still have the group selected. Continuing to move forward in the control panel, we have the ability to add color to an object or to text using the fill color here and the stroke color here. This is pulling from our swatches and we'll be discussing color in a future lesson. Let me remove some objects here by double clicking on that object to get into the group and hitting delete on my keyboard. And that leaves me with just one object to work with. I can apply a stroke value that is a border around this object. Interestingly, there's no icon to the left of this field to let you know that this is the stroke field. So you simply have to know it. And I can use the pop-up menu to get a default. I can type a number in, or I can use the up and down arrows to increase and decrease the stroke. Of course, using the shift key for larger increments. I'm going to put a 20 point stroke on this box. Now this is aesthetically unappealing in most cases, but it will help me demonstrate some of the features available for a stroke. I can then apply a style to that stroke. This is a solid stroke, but I could make it white diamond or Japanese dots, wavy, thick, thin. And this stroke style doesn't really work when you have a one point stroke, you won't really see it. Let me put back a 20 point stroke there. And I'm going to set it back to solid. In most cases, when a stroke is used within a layout, the stroke width will be a quarter point, maybe a half point, maybe a point, but rarely will you see a stroke that's wider than a point, unless it is some sort of design element. Usually a half point stroke is common. What you'll notice about this stroke is that it is straddling the edge of this box. 10 points of that stroke is on the outside of the box and 10 points is on the inside. While there is no right or wrong answer for where you should align the stroke, whether it be on the outside of the box, the inside of the box, or straddling the edge, there is a preference that I believe is correct. But let's first talk about how to manipulate that stroke. I can't do that from the control panel. This is an instance where I'll need to bring up another panel, in this case, the stroke panel. Now it's right over here, I know that, but if I couldn't see it, remember that I can always find panels under the window menu. I'll choose stroke and that will present the stroke panel to me. If it was not docked on the right hand side, it would have opened up for me. Let me do that. I'm going to drag that panel out and close it and then bring up the stroke panel. And there it is on its lonesome. I can then dock that back to the side. But for now, for the ease of this demonstration, I'll pull it out so I can see it next to my object. There's my weight. I can increase that or decrease that just as I can in the control panel. I can also set the type 
down here, just like I can in the control panel. And here I have the alignment of that stroke. So these are my three choices. I can center it like it is now, 10 points on the inside, 10 points on the out, if it was 20 points. I can set it to the inside, which will put all 20 points on the inside of the object. And I can set it to the outside, which will put all 20 points on the outside of the frame. It's common to believe that the outside option is the best option because you don't want to encroach on the content within the box. However, my argument is that since a stroke is only one point, half point, quarter point, maybe two points in size, by setting it to the inside, you are still not encroaching on the content within that box. But what it is allowing you to do is to stay within your grid. When we're designing a layout, we want to work on a grid. We want objects aligned with other objects. So for instance, if I had another box here, and these two objects were aligned, and we'll talk about alignment in a moment. Let me remove the stroke from here. Align these two objects. I'll use the align panel. Again, I'll be dealing with this in greater detail later on. So now they're aligned. If I apply a stroke to this object of, let's say, 10 points, and I set it to the outside or straddling the edge, I can see, if I zoom in here, that I have broken my grid. I'll pull a ruler guide from the ruler, and you can see now these do not line up. And that is unappealing to the eye. We like to stay on our grid. So by taking this object and setting the stroke to the inside, I can maintain the integrity of my alignment within my grid. Let me delete this box. I'll reset my workspace to put everything back the way it was. And now I can continue to work with this object. So there's my stroke. Moving to the right in the control panel, I have effects and opacity and drop shadow. I can apply some very cool effects to this object, like bevel and emboss, or, or an inner and outer glow, and a drop shadow. There's my drop shadow, and immediately my effects panel is brought up so that I can change the parameters of this drop shadow or the other effects. We'll apply a drop shadow later on within our magazine. And then I have opacity. This will allow me to make an object transparent. Right now, this object is 100%. When it is layered with another object, we'll be able to see through that object. For instance, if I draw a box, a frame, and import an image, and then place another image over that object, I'll place an image into this box. We'll be covering graphics in a future lesson. Just that a little bit. If I take that object and place it over the other object, I can apply transparency to this object here in the control panel so that I can see through it and see what is below it. It's very simple to apply transparency to an object. There we go, just a little bit. Let me zoom out. I want to undo everything I've done here. The nice thing about InDesign is that we can undo an unlimited number of times. If I choose undo from the edit menu or command Z or control Z on a Windows computer, you'll undo one step at a time all the way back to the time you opened the document. And every single thing you do is undoable. So I'll simply hold down my keyboard shortcut Command Z since I'm on a Mac. And if I do that one step at a time, I end up going backwards. You can see I can go all the way back to the time I just had. Oh, I went too far. So let me redo by choosing Shift Command Z or Shift Control Z if you're on Windows. And that will take me forward one step at a time until I get to just where I want to be. Continuing in the control panel, we have text wrap options available to us. We also have a text wrap panel that gives us more functionality with text wrap. But if you wanted to just apply your default text wrap options, you could do that right from the control panel. So you can see that Adobe has put so many features into the control panel to give you this functionality right at your fingertips. And as they come out with new updates, you'll find that they continue to add features to the control panel. Let me redock that text wrap panel. 